Okay, so welcome back everyone. And for our final talk of the morning, which is also our final talk of the day, uh, we have Shui Yerli, who will tell us about multi-matroids and rational curves with sigma kappa. Okay, so thanks for coming. Um, I'm talking about roughly three papers with different subtests of these Amazing people. Emily Clager, Chiara Damiolini, Chris Ear, who's here, um, Dazi Huang, who's also here, Rohini Ramadas. Um, and so, um, so I want to start with the big picture first. So, as we probably have already known and have heard from this workshop, that there is a lot of interplay between kind of two kinds of objects on the top of this triangle, which is the first object is polyhedral complex or whatever polyhedral thing that you can think of. On the right-hand side, the second object is matroid, which is the theme of this one. And I want to, I want to um, introduce a third player of this interplay, which is moduli space of curves. And there is actually a tight connection historically. And depending on your background or your expertise, uh, I, uh, this new incidence of this interplay may be seen as a new example or uh, just something to play around when you think about this old interplay. Okay, so this new interplay will be between three um, uh, further generalizations of the pre previous three previous three objects. The first um, object is permutohedral complex, which is not quite a permute uh, polyhedral complex. We'll dive into all of that in more detail. The second type of object is indeed a generalization of matroid coming from topological graph theory. Uh, and then the third uh, generalization is something called moduli space of uh, curves that carries um, cyclic action. And it's this, the, the space that's actually the starting point of this series of work. Okay, so let me uh, still give you some context, but in more detail. Uh, so in type A, there has been this uh, interplay between these three objects. So the upper left, Corner, the polyhedral uh, object um, can be the role, uh, the roles are played by permutahedron or stellahedron. Uh, and then on the right hand side, we have matroid. And then on, on the lower, on the lower line, we have mod moduli spaces of curves that are um, prominently this space called loss of Manning space and some special um, case of something called Hassett space, which is a type of moduli space of curves that's weighted. And then there's a uh, complete list of works that have been studying this interplay. Uh, so for example, uh, Feichner Izvinsky wrote down some representation of um, these matroid chow rings or chow rings of wonderful compactification. And the prominent example was the um, Hassan space or um, moduli space of curves in genus zero. And then Adi Prahito Hohen Katz nonetheless to uh, extend a lot of things to general matroid. And then in the third uh, paper, we have a lot of devel development in the case of, uh, in the direction of intersection theory and K-theory and topological classes. And the fourth paper I wanted to point out is because um, they gave a new presentation of the chow of the matroid will, which will play a big role in what I'm talking about next. And the last paper here uh, is uh, they gave a presentation of a family they give a realization of a family of moduli space of curves as wonderful compactification, which kind of add in the third, third player here. Okay, so let me just say a bit more about what these things are. So the permutahedron variety is the torque variety associated with the permutahedron. Um, so in n equals to three, I have um, this picture shown on the right, and then it is the convex hull of the symmetric orbit of the of the point zero, one, two, all the way to n minus one in the our n dimensional Euclidean space. And we can also think about this polyhedral um, player called uh, stellahedral variety, which is the Tor variety associated to the stellahedron. And roughly speaking, you can see this as a truncation of the unit cube. Um, so what you do is you look at it from either the negative orthon or the positive orthon, depending on what you like, and then truncate the faces that you see in this orthon. Okay, so let me also introduce the moduli space of curves that's uh, playing the role in 
type A case. So uh, the, the first one I'll say is the loss of manning space, which is denoted by L and bar. And it per, it's a parameterizing space. Um, every point in the space uh, gives you a curve um, that is a chain of P1s such that every irreducible P1 component carries at least one market point. And there are N market point to distribute along these P1s. So here's a cartoon of one element in this moduli space. So I can have three. So when N equals to three, so I'm allowed to distribute three points. And I want, um, I want uh, the, so in this example, all the points are separated um, living on separate P1s, but you can also imagine a situation where you only have two P1s and then two of the points live on one thing. And then another scenario is where you only have one P1 and everybody lives there. So, and the, um, the right-hand side, the interplay between this permuted hedron and the loss of many space can be precisely stated as something of the following fact which is that there is a dimension preserving and an inclusion preserving bijection between the faces of the hedron and the boundary strata of the loss of manning phase. So here's a cartoon of that um, bijection. So we have seen that the hedron in n equals to three case looks like this, and it has a two-dimensional phase, six one-dimensional faces, and six zero-dimensional spaces. And the one dimensional, uh, sorry, the two dimensional phase correspond to the smooth locus of this modular space, which is represented by the curve that's one single P1 that carries every mark point. And now, as you go to the boundary of this hedron, by just uh, one time, you go, to, you go to the one dimensional phase, and that means you are degenerating your curve one time and you get two copies of P1 wedged together at a nodal point, and now you have to think about the combinatorics of distributing your three points um, into two parts. So you have six such things, um, and then now you want to go to an even lower dimensional boundary uh, of the, of the permitted hedron. You go to a point, and that means geometrically generating your curve one more time, so you want to separate the P1 that, uh, that carries two market points, and now you get six uh, choices of distributing three market points on three P1s. And you can see that this is dimension include, uh, so the curves that have, the smooth locus of this moduli phase has dimension two, and the strata that are um, represented by one time degeneration has dimension one, and the most degenerated curves uh, or the stratum thereof uh, has dimension zero. So this is indeed dimension preserving and inclusion preserving projection. Um, okay, so, and there is indeed a skin theoretic isomorphism between these two varieties. So the Torah variety associated to the permitted hedron is uh, in fact the loss of manning space. And now, so, uh, if we want to study the, so I personally am very interested in intersection theory of varieties. And so I want to study the intersection theory of these moduli spaces. And because of this identification um, and by this theorem that gives us a presentation of any wonderful compactification or uh, charring of major, uh, sorry, uh, charring of wonderful compactification, in particular this permutahedral variety, I have the presentation of the uh, charring like this. So the it's a ring that's generated by um, H symbols that are like HFs F for each subset of one through N modulo some relations. And furthermore, if you pass to the coefficient R, there is a de degree map by pushing forward this um, the charring to a point. And that means we can compute intersection numbers when we intersect a bunch of classes. Um, that has the right dimension. So they give this theorem that says that the degree of the monomial that's HF1 all the way to HFn minus one is one or zero dependent on some combinatorial condition on the indexing set of the monomial. So if the F1, the set of uh, flats that you choose F1 through Fn minus one satisfy this thing called Dragon Hall Rado, 
condition, which is purely combinatorial, uh, you get one, and if not, you get zero. And so the takeaway from this is that, um, I guess, matroids encode information about intersection theory of modular space of curves. Okay, so this is the type A story. And now um, a, a very recent development that happened in the past few years is that there was a generalization of all these objects in type B. So in type B, um, the generalization for permutahedron is something called the sine permutahedron by taking the um, sine per symmetric, symmetric group orbit of the point zero through n minus one in r minus rn dimensions uh, in rn, and then there is a um, also a generalization in coxeter matroid world that's called delta matroid, um, and that has been studied by these group of people. And then Matt, I think, will talk about this further detail. And um, the third thing, the moduli space of curves in this type B scenario is studied and constructed by Batyrev and Bloom. Um, originally hoping to generalize the type A torque variety to all root systems. And they did succeed in this direction. They constructed torque varieties corresponding to all types of uh, all type, all type, uh, root systems. And so you can ask the question, does this kind of um, phenomenon generalize to other coxeter types in the world of complex reflection groups? So there's in the in complex reflection groups, there's this huge family that's called Kostler groups. Um, and indeed, originally, Batterov and Bloom, in their uh, 2011 paper, uh, constructed tour varieties of all these types. But what happened is uh, for types beyond, C, uh, beyond A and B, they couldn't construct a modular interpretation of those uh, tour varieties. By modular interpretation, I mean pick a point, uh, every point in the tour variety represents on modular, modular space, uh, might represent, uh, represents a curve that has some common term. And then uh, here, the four other authors also communicated that when they tried to develop these tools for these other types beyond A and B, there were some obstructions. But maybe you can check them or there may be updates. Um, so I think, as I understand, there may be some partial progress, but I don't know. So, um, but there's another family of complex reflection groups that overlap with the coxular types uh, in type A and type B. Um, that's called generalized symmetric group for uh, numbers for each pair of number R and N. R is greater or equal to one, and um, we get this triangle, um, which involve permutahedral complexes that we construct and multi matroids that come from. Um, 80s, the 80s, and then moduli space occurs that carry a cyclic action of order R. And so this is the series of work. Um, so let me just say what these objects are. So, what, uh, so first of all, let me say what's a generalized symmetric group, um, SRN for each RNN. So these are matrices with entries in the union of zero and the R through the unity, um, such that every there is exactly one non-zero entry in each row in a column. So you can see that when R is equal to zero, you get back the um, <coughs> sorry. When R is to one, you get back the symmetric group. Um, and the takeaway is so. Not the takeaway, but the goal or the takeaway of this series of work is that multi matroids uh, indeed inform us about um, intersection theory of this moduli space with LR and bar. So I guess I'm trying to say that the goal of this um, talk is to try to convince you that multi matroids informs you about intersection theory. So let me say what the moduli space is. Um, so this moduli space L, R, N bar parameterizes rational curves that have a lot of symmetry and decorations. So first is a curve that um, topologically looks like R chains of P1s, um, and each chain has the same number of P1s, 
that glue together at a single central P1. So we call this a pinwheel curve. Um, and furthermore, it carries an order R. <coughs> oh, it's the same slide? No, it's not the same. <laughs> uh, so are you OK with the topology, the underlying curve? I with, don't know where, what X1 and X2 are doing here. I'm not, I haven't told you yet. Okay. <laughs> I'm telling you one piece of data at a time, and we're at step one. <laughs> <laughs> and so C is a curve that is uh, topologically a bunch of P1s, chains of P1s glued together, and every chain has the same number of P1. And it comes with an automorphism sigma of order r. And what this sigma wants to do is rotate this pinwheel curve. And this rotation information will, um, will be uh, entailed or um, manifested by the decorations. OK, so now what are the decorations? So I have. First, two decorations on the central, central component, which are called X1 and X2. And these decorations have some, something called weights that are worth one half plus epsilon. And these uh, two decorations are required to be fixed by this automorphism. So if you like, you can think that this automorphism fixes the central component P1 um, and fixes the one and infinity or zero and infinity, if you like, and then x1 and x2 are zero and infinity, or your, your choice of uh, fixed points. Maybe I you said that in the first slide, but do all of your chains have the same length starting from your middle component? Yes, I guess. And now the shape of this pinwheel curve um, is also kind of uh, maintained by this this, and this other family of decorations that's called Y mark points. So these Y mark points, um, there are R of them, and each one of them has weight one, and they are required to live on the end of these chains. And by required to, I mean, when we construct this, these curves, we, we require some stability condition for this curve to, to live in this moduli space, and this is, uh, the stability condition of these curves tell you that the weight one points have to live on the end to maintain the shape. And the sigma will want to carry the i y point to the i plus one y point. Okay, so now there are a bunch of more complicated decorations. So there are, in general, n of them. Each one, there are n set of decorations that are I call z, and they are indexed by subscripts one through n. And within each orbit z i, I have r marked points. And these r marked points in this um, ith orbit has weight vanishingly small, and they are living on anywhere you like in this p one. But it has to satisfy um, this symmetry, which is that sigma wants to carry um, the j element in the i orbit to the j plus one element in the i orbit. And you want them distinct, or what? Mm -hmm. they could clash. Yeah. So they have weights vanishingly small, and according to the stability condition, they are allowed to clash. No, no, no. no. <laughs> the is is z i j different from z i j plus one. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. But um, they they can all be the essential component, right? Uh, they they can be on the same. So they can be symmetric. So like the orbit can be actually smaller. Oh no, that's the question. I think yeah, yeah. Might be the, is, is the answer yes or no for that. That's the question. The orbit can, can be smaller. What do you mean? Are they allowed to land on top of x one, x two? Or uh, no, I think because of the symmetry, it has to like live on the. But are there n times r different zijs? Are there n times r different zijs? Um, no, I think they can run into each other. Okay, that was the whole question, actually. 
Maybe what is the stability condition? Yeah. That would resolve it. Um, so how would that resolve the stability condition? It's a different question. But. Yeah, so the stability condition says that every P1 component has to carry at least a weight two. Uh, the weight has to be strictly greater than two. And the weight is calculated by summing up all of the weights of the market points together with uh, nodal points, which are counted as weight one for each nodal point. So for example, if we look at the lower left arm of this curve, this thing, this P1 has a weight one market point, which is this Y, yellow Y, um, and a node. So the node contribute weight one also, and the Z uh, three, three contributes epsilon. So in total, we have two plus epsilon weight on this component. So this P1 is stable. And now that has to be satisfied for all of these things. Does that not imply that each connected component uh, other than the central one has to have at least one of the Zs and therefore that's where all the Zs live? Uh, because you need, you need to add you need to add an epsilon to each connected component except for the central one. Yeah, so to make it stable. Therefore if it's it not stable, then you contract your pinwheel curve. But the length of the chains isn't n. Oh, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so the length of the chain can vary depending on how you distribute your mark points to maintain stability. But as you can see, if you contract if you make one arm unstable, say one. Uh, one Z point decided to travel to another component such that P1, one of the P1s is not carrying anything and that P1 wants to shrink or disappear. And at the same time, all the corresponding P1s in the other arms are also required to disappear because all the marked points in one orbit wants to travel at the same time under the automorphism. And uh, two points can collide if their total weight is less than one, right? Yes. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. That's um, maybe I'm sorry. So theoretically, it would like one of the Zs and X one. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, from yeah. your notation, uh, the allomorphisms are also the data of your functionalized space. Like each point, each point should specify an allomorphism. Each point should set emphasize an. Automorphism. It's the curve each point the in the point and, and sigma. Yeah, each point in the modular space is the data of this tuple. So each point has an automorphism. So, so, so sorry, so do I get it correctly that the z's can coincide with x's but cannot coincide with y's? Correct. <laughs> Great. <And>, sorry. <laughs> and no, no, it's okay. Uh, it's size of one of the x's, you still count it uh, r times. You think it's like r axis, but they kind of have the same position. r axis? What do you mean? Uh, r and z's, sorry. So if yeah. you see it. Sorry, I'm confused. That, so that's the question why we tried to ask it. The z's don't have to be the same. No, no, no. The z's can't can fly. Yeah. But you can't, I guess, but, but you're counting, you, 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 you say you have seven, you, have, you say you have our marked points at the same point, even if they're the same label. Uh, okay. Well, that's my point. I think I'm going to do that. Yeah. Um, anything that sums up to less than one can collide. All right. Okay. So now, um, we are interested in studying the intersection theory of this modular space. Um, and the first step is it would be great if just like its previous um, or precursors, they all are Tor varieties, but this turned out not to be true uh, as soon as we get to R greater or equal to three and N equals or equal to three. Um, so we were trying to do another thing, which is to see if it sits inside of a Tor variety such that this embedding is uh, inducing a Chow equivalence. So indeed, this happened in 2022 
where we, we realize this modular space as a wonderful compactification of some hyperplane arrangements, not in a single projective space like what we have been studying for matroids, but in a product of projective spaces. And, and there's a general theory about how to construct these modular spaces uh, or wonderful compactification of subspaces and varieties. And, um, and we proved that this, indu this embedding indeed induces a, uh, sorry. So also we have to construct this span that's called si sigma RN and the torque variety will um, contain this LRN bar and the inclusion is a child equivalence. So are, are, you, are you saying it's not isomorphic to a torque variety? Or just that there isn't an obvious torque structure? Uh, I don't think it's a torque variety. No. How do you prove that? How do I prove that? Um, you should just say it's not an obvious torque structure. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should say it's not, there's not an obvious torque structure. <laughs> um, so. Are these national? Huh? I think so. There's yeah. Um, so, uh, so now we translate the study of the towering of this variety to the study of intersection theory of this tour, uh, this tour variety x sigma r m. Um, and we want to compute explicitly what are the intersection numbers of interesting generators or elements of this towering. And that's where these combinatorial gadgets that generalize matroid come into play. And before that, I want to tell you what the sigma R is, the torque variety is, um, or the fan is. So these um, fans are called colored fans and is constructed out of colored subsets. So first, um, I want to have something <laughs> called E, and it comes with a partition into N parts. One through EN. And a subset of this ground set E is called pi colored, where pi is a partition. If uh, the subset does not uh, only has at most one element from each part. So just to slow myself down, uh, if E is one, one bar, two, two bar, and then S, that's one and two, is pi colored. But S prime, that is one, one bar two, is not high colored. Okay, and then I want to consider all the set, uh, all the E pi color sets. Um, and this will form a post set um, with the empty set and as its unique minimum. And uh, for, the for the sake of this construction, I want to exclude the empty set and denote this um, post set as pi, r pi times. Um, and so now I want to construct a color fan living inside of a Euclidean space. So let E x denote the sum of the indicator vectors of um, x, and this is a vector in r to the e, for each x that's a subset in e. And I want to consider this vector space um, n pi r that is given by a product of um, spaces corresponding to each part. And each uh, space is the is the E1 um, Euclidean space mod out by the all one vector. So the all one vector means the sum of the indicated vectors within each part. And now, because I'm taking a quotient, um, I also have a bunch of vectors in each of these vector that are denoted by E x bar. And now the pi color sub, um, the pi color fan, uh, sigma pi is the fan that consists of cones that's generated by chains of um, that's uh, that's uh, generated by chain uh, indicator vectors that are given by chains of pi color subsets. So if you have a pi color subset chain S one containing it all the way to S k, and then you look at the indicator vectors, their image in this quotient, and generate a cone from there. 
So this is very similar to the Bergman fan construction. So here's one example. Um, e is one and one bar, two, two bar. And the um, <clears throat> if you think about the, um, the chain, uh, yeah, so, um, so first of all, we have the color sub high color subsets that are the, the colored things, and they generate one dimensional cones in the span. And then every time you have a chain, you generate a two dimensional cone. So one bar two and one bar will generate a two dimensional cone here. So here's a cartoon of this high color fan in the case of this old friend. And now I want to rephrase our theorem about this embedding or the equivalence of chowering um, as um, the special case that we want to study the uh, high color fan when the ground set is n copies of subset uh, sets one through r. And um, in this scenario, we have a inclusion of this small dry space into the Tor variety associated to sigma pi, where pi is this e pi is given by this data. You have a question? Yeah. Um, I've been trying to figure out how this works when r equals one, and I'm confused by the quotienting by r e i in that case, because it seems like that quotienting throws away everything. Uh, yeah, let me, let me think a second. Right, so this is r equals two case, I understand this one. So one slide back. R, r e i is just one vector, it's a sum of coordinates. Right, so in this case, if R is one, it seems like each of those products is a trivial vector space. But I think in that case, your only possible sets are, you know, are, you, one. yeah, no, you get yes, one, general. you get one, and then you get ones that are all labeled different, and then you call this subset one through n. Okay, this is not. I guess I'll keep going then. Yeah, I may want R to be greater or equal to two in this construction. Yeah, I think that's written in the paper. And ah, so R equals one is not supposed to achieve what class. Yes, yeah, I think so. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Thank you for putting that up. And um, okay, so. Um, and of the Procedo Hung and Katz proposition 5.6 tells me um, that, first of all, this sigma pi has uh, the structure of a unimodular pure dimensional and balanced band. So this proposition tells me that there is a degree map um, from the chow ring of this sort of variety to R, even though this band may not be complete in general. So this, um, this degree map is given by in our situation, we pick specifically mass sending maximal cones to one. Um, okay, and then here is a presentation of sigma pi just using torque geometry, and and we want to say that um, now we have a we can compute intersection numbers. So let me tell you what the main theorem is. So in order to state the main theorem, we don't want to compute intersection numbers of the original generators that I gave you, which is something that classically come from Tor variety. I want to perform a change of basis and think about the generators HS for each S in my colored pi color set. And I want to sum up all the generators X S prime that intersects S non-trivially. And this is a change of basis that's inspired by um, uh, Chris Spencer and Connor's work, um, which has elegant intersection numbers as we've seen before. Also kind of like Matthias's S and L. Huh? But this this is like Matthias's S and L. Yeah. The... Uh sorry, I didn't parse the sentence. I do you know what? He had two divisor classes. S L. Matthias. Matthias. Ah, oh, Chris Chris and L. oh okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And um, uh, okay, so if we consider these generators, then um, the our theorem says that the intersection number is the cardinality of some set that can be combinatorially given, um, and it's dependent on the monomial that you are intersecting. So um, this 
said is called transversal of S1 through Sn. And it is a um, the collection of all pi color set that you can get that satisfy that have admit a bijection from the set one through n such that bi lands in si. So here is an example of, what, of what's going on. So namely, um, the transversals one of s one and s two wants to um, wants to consider wants to compute all the subsets of forming one through n regardless of their decorations. So suppose you have this ground set again, and then S1 is one, two bar, and S2 is one bar two, and you want to form the set one through N regardless of what, whether they carry a hat or not. So in this case, you can pick one from S1 and two from S2, or you can pick S one bar from S1 or two bar from S2, but that's your only choices. So these are the transversals. One bar is in S1? Uh, oh, did I make a mistake? Yeah, uh, one bar is in S2 and then two bars is in S1. So I'm, I swapped the color in the second two, second. Okay. And so this tells you that the intersection number is two. Can you say the T is again? So T, uh, which one, oh. the early T or the? The later T. I, oh. Never mind, I see it in your definition. So yeah, so curly T contains all ways of forming um one through n, one from each one of your S I, such that the resulting set um is one through n and regardless of the decorations. Is the is the point for this to be like the a maximal um Face of the fan on um, maximal face of like the fan or like some sort of maximal. Yeah. So some it, yeah, it will it, it will restrict you into like a, a maximal or or cent or whatever. Thanks. Um. Okay. So and then one remark is that this is analogous to what happened in the case of Chowring, um, and also generalizes what happened in type B when R is equal to two. Um, and then the type B situation was proven by these four authors. Um, and that's their theorem A, B. So this doesn't cover the case R equals one. That's why you said analog. Oh. Yeah, yeah. R equals one, that's the intersection numbers on cellophedral variety. And then that's, Similar in spirit, but it's like slightly different. It's one and zero. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and then how multi-matrix came to play in this computation is that we constructed divisors associated to multi-matrix and independent polytopal complices of, of multi-matrix, and then these intersection numbers turn out to be um, volumes or computed by volumes of these independent polytopal complices. So let me say a word about what multi matrix are. So these are objects that's uh, invented by Boucher um, in the 90s, and it is defined exactly on this ground set that we have seen before. So a ground, big ground set E com that comes with the partition pi, and um, it can be expressed as a rank function from the set of all, all pi color set to non negative integers that sends by a bunch of very matroid like axioms. So, first of all, rank of empty set is zero. And also, given any pi color set and an element that's destroyed from this pi color set, um, you want to be able to augment this set and have a, a rank restriction on the augmentation. So it says that the rank can be has to be greater or equal to the original rank after augmentation, but has to be bounded um, by increasement by one. And the sec the third condition is a submodularity that's also very similar. Um, but this is only for all pi color sets or pairs of pi color sets such that their union is still pi color. 
And then the last con condition is rather strange. Um, that's not present in the matroid. So if you have a pi color set and two elements from a, set, a part that's destroyed from this set, um, you want to be able to say that at either X or Y has to increase the rank when you augment the original set. Okay, so now we want to define divisors of multi-matroids. Um, so D of M is equal to the sum of all, a weighted sum of the XS, um, where the weights are the rank of the set S. And recall that XS is the generator of the tau rank. And for each matroid, I want to define something called an independence polytope. Um, and to do this, I want to first construct something called independence polytopal complex of a um, restriction of the rank function into a, a individual pi color set. So for a pi color set in here, the rank function of the multi-matroid restricted on S is going to be a matroid on S that's denoted by MS. And then for each MS, you can construct the independence polytope by just taking the convex hull of the vectors that correspond to um, the, yeah, the set at I, and then take the union of them all, you get a polytopal complex. And so for example, here, when uh, the ground set is the original um, friend, and then suppose this multi-matroid has so-called independent set, which, I, which is also defined similarly, um, these sets, and then I can form an independence polytopal complex like this. And here you can see that it's kind of glued together of four polytopes, and each polytope actually is a independence polytope of a matroid. And that matroid is the restriction of the multi-matroid on a high color set. So for example, the square in the positive orthon is the restriction of the rank function on the set one, two. And um, our theorem that computes the intersection number, which will imply theorem A, is that if Dn is the divisor of a multi-matroid, then the top degree intersection power of this Dn will be um, computed as the volume of this independence polytopal complex. And so here, because our fan is not uh, compact, so we use a technique that's uh, introduced by Anastasia and Dusty Ross, uh, that's called normal complexes, and they also compute their volumes. And one technical issue that we encountered is that this divisor of the multimatroid in general does not satisfy some con technical condition in their paper that's called cubical condition. So um, we decide to enlarge our definition of multimatroid to something called um, R, blackboard R multimatroids that seem more similar to our original multi-matroid, uh, sorry, original matroid axioms. So these are going to be um, our valued function, uh, rank functions on the original ground set. And then now I want to remove the um, boundedness on the condition in the second condition and maintain the sum modularity. And I also want to remove the, the weird condition that distinguishes from matroid. And after doing this extension, um, we can do a bunch of, this really like facilitates the computation. And in particular, we can see this R multi-matroids as some sort of gluing of real value polymatroids and reduce the computation of this top degree power to the case of um, multi uh, polymatroids. And then this is computed already in the works of Chris, Jun, and Matt, and then more. <laughs> That. Uh, so I think I will end here, and then the takeaway is we generalize these two triangles. Questions for Shu? So in type B, what is the modular meaning of that? Uh, so it's curves that is that looks like a chain of P1 with a central component but it carries an involution. 
Oh, so it's just R equals two case. Yeah. Does the torque variety of the polytope you were just constructing and then the play now? Yes. The torque variety of the polytope, you mean the uh, independence yeah. polytopal complex. So in general, it's going to be not a poly. Oh, it's it's the faces are going to be very weird. It's not no longer. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. So the yeah, I haven't considered the independence polytopal complex. Yeah. Or the torque variety thereof. Is, is there a nice characterization yeah. of these R multimatroids in terms of their polytope polytopal complexes, like along the lines of the Bill Fund? Uh -huh. That's an interesting question. Yeah, I don't know. Is the independence polytopal complex convex? Um Uh, I want to say no, but I need to, yeah, in three dimensions is a little strange. Yeah, I don't think that's the case. Yeah. Is there some notion of valuativity for these multimatroids? Good question. I, from our knowledge, the, the theory of multimatroid is really, really not developed uh, from our community, so I encourage everyone to. <laughs> Think about it. So, for example, we don't even have the notion of all these cryptomorphisms or cryptomorphic definitions. We don't have flats. We don't have, uh, I don't know, duality. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So, it's very unclear. So, this construction is kind of Bergman Fanny. And in that context, you, alongside Matt and Sam and Nick, studied the K theory of these varieties and um, show that it's like generated by line bundles and these sort of things. Yeah. And there's also a nice basis for these coming from the nested basis of Chris and Spencer and Connor. Yeah. Do you have similar K theory results for these varieties? Um, the vertical variety or the, the modular space? So that was the original motivation for computing these intersection numbers. Uh, so we don't have uh, ongoing work on this, but we were hoping that something can follow from, from there. I do know that um, uh, Emily Clater, Dusty Ross, and uh, Melody Chen and Charlie Clevens are doing some K theory for uh, the tropical fans that um, that continue that's continuing the line of this normal complexes and um, volume computation. Do you have a nested basis type thing on, on the Chowring side? Nested basis, I think so. Yeah, at least for our. Do you have an uh, interesting uh, enumerative geometric result from from these intersection numbers? Oh yeah. So um, if I'm interpreting your question correctly, so the one of the motivation for changing the basis to these weird HSs, at least in our case, is uh, they are pullbacks of side classes from smaller um, moduli spaces. Um, so you can interpret these intersections if you like has intersection of side classes that people will like. Yeah, compute in the world. Is the automorphism group of this variety interesting? That's an interesting question. The type A is, there was a... Yeah. Um, you know what they are? I think they are the reef product of uh, S, N with uh, the uh, n through root of unity. The words not continuous are the whole. I changed that. Oh, that the tails that. Okay. At least. At least. Okay. Yeah. So maybe. Uh, okay. So possibly bigger. I mean, for for r equals two and n equals one, it's p one. So can be bigger. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh-huh, yeah. No further questions, let's thank Shunya.